Welcome back, folks, to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. On today's show, we have Al Usinski from Inside Dot Lighting. Man, we have a couple coming up with him hot because first we wanted to talk about how we're going to sell our way out of this thing, Greg. That's what we have to do right now, more than ever. Find a way to sell something, get out of it, move on. This episode Good of the discussion. podcast is brought to you by Keystone Technologies. Go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, baby. That's KeystoneTech.com. Light made easy. The Retrofit Kings, and here's Ooh. a great Retrofit product they have, is their adjustable light LED, or sorry, f- color selectable LED light engines. And what these are, are little Retrofit kits that you can put into fixtures. I've actually used them in decorative wall sconces in apartment buildings or ceiling fixtures. Sometimes you don't want to just jam a bulb in there or the sockets are brittle or whatever the case might be, but you want to keep the aesthetics of the fixture. You want that thing looking hot. You slam this thing in. Before, up until about a month ago, great kit, everything was cool, but you had to pick your color. Now, you can select your color in the field. You put the fixture in, you start in 35K, and they say, I want a little whiter. Okay, click. It's that easy. And I can't tell you how many times I've dealt with apartment complexes that don't know what color they want, and you put something in, and then they say, I wish it was whiter, I wish it was yellower. Now you don't have to worry about it. Keystone gives you the retrofit kit to make it happen. This is why you got to go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. One of the, you know what? They're so practically innovative. Like actual items you need in yeah, the field. Here, sell you this. Sell. this is cool. <laughs> sell your way out. Yeah. K e y s t o n e t e c h dot com, and of course the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. That's naild dot org. Sign up. Join us. Get associated. What are you waiting for, son? You know that we're the coolest guys in the lighting business. Come on. Get a grip on lighting. Welcome back to the Get a Grip on Lending podcast, Al. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to be here. Yeah. Say hi to Greg Eric. Hello, Greg. <laughs> hi again. It's been a long time. Good to see you. Hey, today we wanted to talk a little. Uh, I know you have the lighting background and everything, but you also have some sales background. Have you you've done some professional selling courses in the past? Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I have. I um, I was a student at the Dale Carnegie Center of Excellence on Third Avenue in Manhattan back in the '90s. I eventually became a um, you know, part of the part of go, uh, I guess, a teaching assistant, and then eventually went through the training to be an instructor. And I did some side stuff, uh, which included being a professor, an adjunct professor at a couple of universities in Philadelphia, Temple, and Drexel on professional selling skills. So it's a passion of mine. I, I must have read 50 books over the years on selling and sales skills. And now as we are in this, this worldwide pandemic, um, selling under these circumstances is quite an interesting twist on things. So i um, interested to have that discussion with you guys today. Yeah, and that's what I wanted to get at because, I mean, I do this podcast on you know some of the time, but I'm out selling light bulbs every day and I need to figure out it's changed a little in the last couple of months, and I need to figure out what, what I need to do differently, how I need to interact with people, and um, just make more sales. Give us some tips. Sure. Well, I think if I could just take a step back to um, uh-huh. what it is. You guys have businesses. You've hired plenty of salespeople over the years. In my various roles for manufacturers, I've um, hired salespeople and sales managers to do uh, revenue-producing jobs. And you know, when you look at what makes a good salesperson, and I'm talking about before the pandemic, you would hire that person because they have a certain amount of knowledge or you can train them on what they need to know. They have the, the right attitude, the right presence, the ability to present, the ability to uh, prospect for new customers, ask that customer question, identify their needs, produce their solutions, and then overcome objections, close the deal, service and follow up, all those things which an outside salesperson or sales manager needs to be fairly competent on. And then when you think back to those those interviews, when you were evaluating those skills that when you hired that salesperson, you might have asked them how their computer skills were and how proficient they were in PowerPoints or Excel, but that's not the main reason you hired them. And then they come on board and you learn that some of them are really good at PowerPoint, some of them suck at Excel, and you just kind of deal with it. But that's a secondary importance. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because now 
salespeople are chomping at the bit to get out. These people that, that tend to, maybe they, they travel large regions or they travel locally to, um, to provide a service for their company and, and, and generate revenues and meet with customers and compete with the other guys in town that are doing the similar things. Um, now they're, they're chained to their, their office in their finished basement or their spare bedroom or their dining room table. And now they don't have the ability to connect with customers the way that they used to. So how do we do that? Well, we still got the phone. We still have emails. And Greg, I heard you mention on a, on a, I think it was one of your April podcasts about how, um, and I totally agree with you, how, how people are, are on their computers a lot more now and they're being much more responsive to emails than maybe they were um, before the pandemic started. So I, I agree with that notion, but I also think, how do we, how do we assess our activity that's turning into actual results? Now, we, um, we know that there's going to be people whose projects are put on hold, who might not be able to ship product to a construction site because the construction sites shut down. But at the same time, um, the pandemic is not an excuse to do nothing or to do less. I think we have to just get creative in the ways that we do this. And one thing that we did on Inside Lighting was we, um, we got, I guess we were amused, but also interested in some of the things that people were doing on social media and other platforms to engage with their customers. And so we wrote a piece called Marketing from Home. And uh, people have been pretty effective using LinkedIn and sometimes Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube on getting their message across with, uh, with messages on LinkedIn or photos. Um, I know there was this one lighting agent in San Diego that produced a social distancing spin on, you know, what's six feet. And it was, you know, the, dis the distance and they, they, they did the illustration. It was, it was three two by twos or it was 14 bollards wide. And, and I thought that was a clever way to kind of use the existing thing, but also create some interest for their, uh, the brands that they represented. Um, another lighting agent in New England um, had a really casual, like hats on backward Friday, 4 p.m. happy hour where they ran bingo on Instagram live. And, you know, you put the hat on backwards, you have cocktails in the, in the, uh, the, the, the live video and they gave away prizes like, um, you know, Uber Eats and Grubhub gift cards. And um, they even gave away a bidet when, when there was a toilet paper store shortage. So they, they had fun <laughs> with it. They had over a hundred people on this, uh, on, on their, their Instagram feed. So, so some of those things sound you know, a little gimmicky, but at the same time, it's a way for customers to engage, uh, vendors to engage with their customers without necessarily having that face-to-face that -face interaction. If you take that to more of a serious level, you look at some of the ways that people are using the social media, and I'm not gonna try to profess myself as one social media expert, but on LinkedIn, for instance, um, the types of people that are on LinkedIn in our industry are probably more prone to be you know, more the, the, the specifier and some of the, 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 you know, the office working contractor types that make the buying decisions. Um, and it's going to be less so the, the facilities person or the, 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 the job site type contractor. But still, if you're focusing on those markets, um, it's it, the 98 percent of people on LinkedIn don't post content. They visit, they look at updates, they see what their friends are doing, what their work colleagues are doing, but they don't post content. So there's a lot of white space there. And. Frankly, I've seen some crap on LinkedIn about what people are trying to promote as a virtual sales call. It feels like their boss gave them an assignment to do a video. And then you see, you know, Harvey McGillicuddy from his dining room table with the China cabinet in the background. He's in the lighting industry, but the lighting sucks. And he's going through this like sample case and he starts his, his seven minute video with, you know, what I want to talk about today is the blah, blah, blah fixture from XYZ company. And, yeah, you know, it, it's I can't find that X button fast enough to stop that video because it's just not it's just not good. Um, if you think about if you're on social media as a participant, whether it's business related or not, the things that get your attention quickly are the things that just dive right into it. And both you guys are good at this. I've seen you guys in action. So you, you dive right into the message. No long introduction, no long preamble. You say, hey, if I could save you, if I could save your facility 22 percent on energy costs you'd want to know about it what we you just doing? you just you just captivate someone with something like that we ju we just had a conversation about that today we're, we're doing an educational program and um we we have um we're building these scripts for the the program it's supposed to be a three to five minute each each module is supposed to be two to five minutes maybe seven at the most and the scripts you're looking at it's like hi my name is xxx i'm this that cut all that out 
Yes. Just go right into it. Don't wait. Let people figure out who you are at the end or later on. Don't crack a joke that might not be funny to 50% of the people. Don't do anything. <laughs> Just start talking about the topic right away. Think of it as video Twitter. That's it. You just have to dial it into the information people want because in terms of whether you're selling or you're, you're creating an online educational product or whatever, if you start talking for two or three minutes that's not on point, people are going to be gone. I had a politician that um, wanted to talk to me about something up here in Canada. Long story. We're not going to get into that. But he started, like his campaign manager came on and started talking and talking and talking. And he just saw like the, the Zoom thing click, 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 click. Like people just getting out of there. They don't want to listen to this guy. Where's the candidate? You know what I'm saying? Where's the guy? It's like we came here. I don't have half an hour to listen to you pontificate on garbage. I don't care about, I actually don't even care about politics. I just want to talk to this guy, you know? So I think you're 100% nail on the head on that. I think what we're learning in this age is to get rid of the nonsense and get right to the point. If someone wants to know more about you, they will go to your LinkedIn profile. Okay? Right. Right. They Otherwise, they don't care. Move on. Get to the point. And um, no, you're totally right. And I think yeah. people sometimes they're 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 forcing they're forcing their agenda mm -hmm. on It's the discourteous. Person. It's discourteous. Yeah. Rather than understanding what the hell that person wants to hear from you, you're saying, hey, here, here's my six talking points that I got in my last sales meeting, and I'm going to ram them down your throat whether they apply to you or not. We need a new it's, etiquette. It's hard to digest that. We need yeah. a new etiquette. We need an etiquette for yeah. digital meetings. We need an edi etiquette, like a new social etiquette of how you should behave when you're on Zoom or when you're on Google Meet or when you're on a, a podcast or whatever. How you should behave. This is what you do, dude. Nobody wants to know you. Everyone can find out about you, whatever. These are the rules. This is the etiquette of this because you have Zoom meetings with people and they have no idea how to, I've been, we've been used, doing this for four years now and it's mm -hmm. like, we know, but so many people think it's like, first I have to, oh, I'm here. I, let me just get a coffee. I'll be right back. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah. You didn't, what, what you're going to get it? Oh, you have to go to the washroom? What you, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> We're not, I'm here right now. We're doing this thing right now. So, um, yeah, I think we need a new etiquette, Al. No, I'd, I'd agree, and yeah, there's uh, there's there's plenty of uh, humorous things as well as like 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 twelve tips to make your Zoom meeting successful. Things online that you can find, but yeah, some people just don't get it, and and even especially for lighting people, there's plenty of people that that just have crappy lighting when they're uh, when they're when they're meeting with a potential customer, which I think is a bad it's a bad look too. So we need mm -hmm. to um, put our best foot forward, and you know you don't, you have to continue to to make those impressions that you can't make in person, and now we're doing it virtually, and um, if we can maybe talk talk about the the way that these these virtual sales interactions are going to continue. So um, I wasn't suggesting earlier that we need to just turn into social media influencers, but but certainly that's that's one path that we could we could look at. But when you think about how the world is opening up, it's not going to happen in an instant. Um, you know, we, we still you know the governments and, and and it varies everywhere we go, and I tend to think that people. Um, process their willingness to get back out in the mix, whether it's business or personal, go to restaurants and things like that, based on their own personal situation. I happen to live in um, you know, the city of Atlanta. I live in the Buckhead section amidst some tall buildings, and I share an elevator and a high rise with 400 people. So touching elevator buttons, the mail room and the, the trash chute and other things is a different vibe for me. The, the restaurant over my right shoulder is a great French restaurant, but it's boarded up because of some recent riots that happened in, in a lot of different cities across the nation. So, so right now, like there's a, in the city, there's a feeling of, geez, we're still staying in our, in our, in our homes and working remotely. But in the suburbs, um, I was talking with um, one of the major agents in Atlanta uh, last week, and they said that they were reopening in their, their suburban office and they're going to have, you know, distancing guidelines. And, and I think, you know, whatever happens and none of us can predict it because it's, it's, it seems like it changes uh, every week, every month, whatever happens, it's going to be phased in these interactions. So will you be able, and do you want to go to lunch with a customer? Will that lunch be able to have more than four people? Um, would you accept a golf date from, not a golf date, a golf invitation from a vendor? Um, would you be in the same golf cart as him or her? So, so some of these things are questions we have to answer ourselves. And, um, and I think also there's going to be some of the larger companies that put restrictions on their people, their ability to get out there and interact. I know I talked to one company yesterday that 
that said that um, that it's a fireable offense if you and a coworker are in the same car simultaneously. And, um, you know, another company was saying that they're shut down through October 1st as far as face-to-face -face sales calls. And if you need to get face-to-face, -face, then you need to get permission. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see how we do it. But but the, the thing we need to do is adapt short-term and long-term for whatever this looks like after we get out of this, uh, the, the, the most of these pandemic fears. I could go off on my personal views on all that, but I'm going to restrain because it's the lighting podcast. Um, <laughs> and we want to deal with the practical. I think you're right um, about your observation and whether or not that's right or wrong is for a different show. Um, but, you know, when you look at it uh, from a perspective of somebody working in a company whose job it was to handshake and get out there, and it might be time to start looking for a new career. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever people see. Is it looking for a new career or is it generating new skills? Kind of like oh, the draftsman people, in 1990 who turned into a cat operator. Yeah, that's a, that's a dream for most people. I mean, most people can't change their, their job mid-career. They can't do it. Um, there's, you know, what yeah. you're going to see, like some, I mean, there's some people that are going to be good at it and they would probably always would have been good at it. It's not like they're going to acquire this idea that somebody can acquire new skills is false. Mm -hmm. I think the people that acquire the new skills already had the potential to do that. They just weren't doing it. And then there's people that just don't have the potential to do it. I mean, I had a, a window guy at my house who's in his seventies, putting me on windows. He's got a mask on. Okay. Comes into my home. That's okay. I mean, whatever. I can, I don't want to go off on my own opinions on this, but, um, comes into my house and he whips out the old order book, the old order pad, right? Good company. He's got his order book, right? And he's writing up, drawing up windows, all the other companies. I went with him by the way, but all the other companies had digital proposals and the window things, all the thing. He drew it all out with us on paper. He's not going to change. Now maybe he's in his seventies, no. but there's a lot of people in their forties and fifties that are really, we were doing one thing and they're going to be asked to do a completely different thing. And not all humans have the same potential. Some people that are good at that are just not going to be good at this. And that's it. There's just no way out of it. Just like the people before who were not good at that, who were not good at handshaking and going and playing golf. Like my worst nightmare, my worst nightmare would be to go play golf with someone I don't know. I would be so anxious about that. What am I going to talk about for five hours you know, with somebody I don't know? Like that's yeah. big time anxiety for me. Um, I don't want to do that. I never want to do that. I don't. I don't. I. I've probably taken customers out for lunch maybe once, maybe twice in twenty years. I don't do that. I don't sell on that. It's not my style. But people right. that were used to doing that, they're good at that. They're schmoozers. That's what they do. They schmooze people. They make them feel good. They take them out. Now, I don't mind if someone takes me out, but I wouldn't want to be the person taking someone out for five hours. So there's people that are good at that. And I just don't think they're going to be, they're going to be able to change gears. Greg, am I wrong? Do you tell me? I think you're right to some degree. I mean, I think, I think a, a hybrid approach is the right way to do it. You're going to have to learn both angles if you're going to be successful. Uh, but there are people that are going to be successful and, and your advice is probably right. If they can't do it, they got to figure out what they can do and move on because it, it, it's changed. And, uh, and I think, you know, I mentioned it before too. I, I've been to a number of face-to-face -face meetings. Sorry for anyone who might be offended. This is June, and I've been to quite a few of them. Um, people are still meeting, but handshake's gone, and you stay away from people. So that's always the odd interaction when you first start something off, and it's always a comment. It's like, oh, I guess we can't shake hands now, so let's wave. So you just gotta you gotta roll with it. You gotta you gotta be able to adaptable, and you gotta be able to do both to be successful. I had a sales no, meeting where I, they called me in for my expertise, and I'm walking in. It was, um, anyway, I'm not going to say what it was because I don't know who listens to this. So I walk into the sales meeting and they said, uh, oh, you need to wear a mask. So I'm not willing to wear a mask. I won't do it. So I just walked out. He said, okay, I'm not interested in the deal. That was it. I thought walked you weren't out. doing your opinion here. No, but I'm just saying, I'm, that's not, that's <laughs> yeah. my, that's me. That's not my opinion for everybody. If you want to wear sure. a mask, come go get the deal. I'm not, I'm not doing that. So the guy called me back the next day and he's like, come back. Come do, come do the, come do the, give me the proposal. And we talked about some stuff, but I mean, for me, it's like, I just, I, as where I'm at in life, I would rather retire right now than change the way I've done things for 20 years. It's not worth it. Now, other people, you're going to see them get pushed 
into a very uncomfortable space. And you may want to think, you know, maybe the, oh, I could go on on this, oh, I'm so tempted to go off on this, but um, <laughs> you may, we may want to think about whether or not that's worth it. Like it's a trade-off, Al. Like what we're saying is that, what we're saying is that we're so scared to interact in the old way that, which is known, we know what happens when we interact in the old way. We know what happens. Sometimes you get sick. Sometimes you die. People die. We know that people die. That happens. But um, in the new way, we, we have no idea, but we're going to try this instead. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I could go really off on this, but I'm not sure. I think, you know, when it comes to developing those skills, is there any advice you have for people that are just, other than finding a new career, is there any other advice that you could give for people, patience? Is it, what is it? Well, I think, um, let me start by giving an example of, of in our industry where, where, where people of a certain skill set um, were either morphed into a new type of employee or were replaced by people with those skill sets. And, and that goes back to when, when the LEDs started being designed into these manufacturers' lighting products. You had the ballast and lamp people that would sell their, their components to the lighting manufacturers. And they, you know, they do their monthly swing throughs. They bring the donuts and they write the POs and the orders, check the inventories, and then move on to their next, uh, their next manufacturer, their next, ta- their next town. But, but slowly, those people morphed into being kind of component skew driven people into being like design in engineering types who could actually sit with an engineering team and determine the technical nature of those components and how to apply them to the fixture that the, the manufacturer wants to build. And so it took a much higher level of technical aptitude, technical understanding and skill. And uh, to your earlier point, Michael, yeah, a lot of those people that were more component and model number driven, um, weren't able to adapt into that, that engineering problem solver, talking about all the, the technical aspects of applying LEDs to a new fixture that was being uh, considered by that, that, that manufacturer. So now as we look at this, I tend to think that this is a temporary situation, right? It's not gonna be like this forever. Um, but, but when we get out of this, it's, it might look different, a little different or a lot different. We, we still need to see that. So what we need to do in the, in the meantime is, is adapt. And, and that would be from the company level. How's the company going to adapt? Okay, maybe, maybe instead of you know, furloughing people, maybe we need to bring on some people who have better marketing skills because the, 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 the basics of it, selling is one-to-one, marketing is one-to-many. And you need to get that message out to the many. Where are your customers? How are you able to reach them now that they're, they're at home? rather than in the field um, as they used to be. So once we recalibrate that, then you break down to the skill level and talking about that salesperson, you know, I think a lot of the same skill, sales skills are, are still gonna translate, which is good communication, asking good questions, understanding their needs, providing good solutions, overcoming objections. Those all, those all still stay steady, but now we have to do it from a different media, which is phone, texting, phone conversation, uh, emails, et cetera. Yeah, I think it, I've seen a little bit of the dynamic change even before this, you know, in terms of most of my proposals used to be in person and for the last two, maybe three years, and maybe this is me, but it's been email. And I, and I think, I think mo- most people are going by that. And, you know, people that were used to the face-to-face meetings are, are kind of going away now too. So I, I think it's just the norm now, Mike. I think that's just how it's going to be, man. We got to be online. We got to be able to do it. You got to be able to be in person too if they need it, but you got to be able to be online. Yeah. I mean, the, I think, I think Al hit it on the head when he talked, he gave, made the database relationship. It's a one to many versus one to one. Yeah. Right. Like that's a very, that's, you know, um, you know, uh, a good analogy. But what is lost, Al? Well, what is lost is the, 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 the intrinsic human on human or mask to mask trust that you have that, that you build, the rapport that you build, whether it's someone you've known for, 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 for a month or someone you've known for a decade, um, that human interaction, people at its core do business with people. So that's lost. And I think the longer the relationship, the more you can sustain um, these obstacles that currently have us. But the other part is the, 
the, the message of what's lost. I, I, you know, the A&E firms right now, a lot of them aren't back in the office. And when they're selecting fixtures for their projects, when they're specifying them, um, they like to look at their fixtures in person uh, for, for some of the, the key fixture types. And now, you know, you have a salesperson dropping off the fixture sample on the front porch of the A&E person, and they then take it in and might spray it with Lysol and look at it. And so you, you don't have that, that normal brainstorm rapport that you have. And, and in fact, there was an um, agent I was talking to in Grand Rapids yesterday. Uh, they were setting up a green screen and doing videos to do product presentations with, with boom mics and, and lavalier mics because they, they realized they need to reach their customers. And, and the current way of Zoom meetings and a factory webcast with 14 canned PowerPoints and someone from the factory reading them to the, the customer isn't the way that's going to continue that customer loyalty. We need to uh, find different paths and, and being creative and amidst these, these challenges um, is, is, is part of the key. Hmm. Hmm. There you go. Al, that's a, uh, you have any final thoughts? I mean, um, you ha you said here, what will selling look like as we return to face to face? So you're optimistic. Um, what do you think that's going to look like? like? How does it, how do we break out of this? This, uh, because there's two lockdowns. There's the actual lockdown, which is a law or a directive from government saying your your um, your your freedoms are no longer allowed, and free enterprise is no longer allowed. And then there's like, okay, well, you, you know, you're allowed to be free again, but people aren't going to want to. Like, I know a lot of people that absolutely have bought into this whole hog, and you know, hey, I'm not here to criticize you. But uh, anybody that's listening, but a lot of people have like believe that the future should be like this, right? So you're optimistic. And so if you're optimistic, you say, as we return to face-to-face -to -face interactions, what's that going to, how weird is that going to be, Greg? Are people really going to bump elbows? Are they really going to sit? Like, are they, are you going to be able to say, can I come into your office? I mean, what is the, what is the vibe going to be like, Al? How do you see it coming? Yeah, you, well, from my standpoint, the meetings I've had, I just let the customer lead it. I have my mask ready. I'll put a mask on if they need it. I want the sale, Mike. I don't care about a mask. Um, I won't wear it normally, but I'll put it on if I could. It helps me sell. So I have the mask with me. I ask them what I'm, basically, whatever their comfort level is, I'm willing to do. And you got to be able to adapt to that. If they want you to let them open the doors, walk behind them. Keep your distance, have your mask, hands up. You can't really shake them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's what it's going to be, at least for the short term. I don't know. I don't, I've, and I've told it, said it before, the handshake's gone. I'm confident in that. So, I don't know what it's going to be, though. Yeah, I don't know if it'll be an elbow bump or something else. Uh, I, I was somewhere where some people were, were tapping shoes the other day, and that seemed awkward and I, something I wasn't very coordinated to do. But in, in, the, in the whole scheme of things, I think. Um, It'll calibrate itself. I think we're going to see, um, based on where we live, based on you know the general population, based on all these other factors, um, it's not going to just be like a you know a flip of a switch. It's going to be phased in, just like um, if those of you have been to a restaurant in the last few weeks, you've seen the, the servers with masks. Some of the booths are closed. The distancing is, is happening there. It's going to be multi-phase, frankly, until probably um, somehow this dissipates or or, or the, the uh, vaccine is commercially available and, and widely used. Um, so from that standpoint, we have to adapt to the new norm. We have to be really good communicators when we don't have that ability to communicate face to face. Um, I think what Greg said a moment ago, which is deferring to the customer, mm -hmm. um, there's going to be some people who are completely on edge and maybe they have really good reason. Maybe they have a pre-existing conditions themselves and they live with an elderly person and they don't want to bring anything home. So, so, um, not judging that person, but if they're really on edge, I'm going to respect that. And um, but if there's people who are loosey goosey and uncomfortable, you know, grabbing a, 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 a sandwich with them for lunch and, and talking business, let's 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 go do it and be responsible about it. Um, but ultimately being um, staying on top of our of our customers, the communication. But the important thing is to add value to the customers with each interaction. One of the things that's frustrated me during this this pandemic is that I see a lot of salespeople um, not adding value. It's, it's just kind of just like whatever their pitch is. And it's like, hey, we have a training seminar on XYZ manufacturer, but rather than pitching the brand of the manufacturer, you could say, hey, if, if, if 
you know, if you're going to be doing anything hospitality related, that might be a bad example given uh, hospitality budgets these days. But, you know, you, you pitch the, the customer need rather than pitching, hey, we have XYZ brand, uh, you, you, you can get a CEU if you sit in on this seminar. So we need to add value in our interactions, touching in with customers just to say, hey, anything I can do to help you? What's the status of that project? There's plenty of projects on hold, but I, I, I talked to two lighting designers last week that said, yeah, one was on hold, but we got two more in the inbox too. So there's going to be opportunities. We just have to keep our contacts um, in the touch base mode. And then when it's time to add value, the customer will, will hopefully dial our number or shoot us the email when it's time to, uh, to add value for that customer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with um, some thoughts on my own um, on this. I think the number one thing, if you're in sales, you got to keep working, whatever that is. If you're, if you're a sales people, person, you got to hustle, man. You got to find a way to be hustling. And the, uh, what sales people do, in my opinion, unlike marketers. So marketers look at a group. They look at groups of people. They look at subsets of groups, right? And then they create a message. And what's your branding? What's your message? And then they, they push out towards a group. I think, I think a salesperson is not a marketer, Al. I think a salesperson is on those one-on-one -on -one interactions. Is that one-to-one? Um, -one. And I think you have to push through this and find ways to make meaningful, unique interactions with your customers. And I don't think there's anything wrong with flat out asking your customer, what is your um, coronavirus protocol? <laughs> like, how do we interact? Just ask them. Oh, we don't really know. We're kind of just doing this. Hey, do you, you know, are you, I'm going to be grabbing a sandwich in your area next week. Um, you know, I mean, you could kind of do a way where you feel it out before you actually got there. Cause I think a lot of it's awkward, like when you show up and it's weird. Right. So I think sales guys, man, sales gals out there, just hustle it. Keep hustling, find a way, be courteous. As Greg says, have a mask ready and, um, and, uh, you know, try to get out there. And I, I don't think we're going to get away from that one to one Al. I think the salespeople are going to be one to one. I think I don't think salespeople deal in subsets. I think they deal with individuals. No, I would agree, and I think um, you know, turning those those one to many messages, they ultimately need to drill down to that one to one. Otherwise, the sale typically doesn't happen. So, mm. um, so no, I concur with that. And just to add two more cents on that, the the companies need to provide their people with good resources, sales resources, sales sheets, spec sheets. Those types of things are way more important now. A good website is super important because you don't have that salesperson in that conference room as often anymore to provide those answers and to provide that um, all that information. So, but but yeah, it's it's hard to replace the face to face, the interactions, the one on one brainstorms. But um, finding ways around it and still having that that dialogue and those conversations are really important. The good people will survive. The the ones who aren't so good at it need to grow and figure it out or they'll be um, you know, looking for, for other directions to go. So it's an interesting time. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, you guys are survival of the fittest minded. I'm sure you'll continue to thrive. And we all need to uh, follow that type of energy and that type of advice to, to, to get out of this on the other end with some good prospects. Who knows? You know, um, my father started Atlas Lighting in 1977. And I remember talking to him, uh, gosh, it's got to be a lot, 20 years ago. And we had some problems and we were trying to fix these problems. And I just started working for him. And he said, you know what, you know what I do when I can't figure out my problems? I said, what's that? He says, I sell my way out of them. So get after it. Maybe we can sell our way out of this thing. Maybe the sales guys will be the first and the sales gals will be the first people to fix this, to get out in the field and figure out what the new etiquette's going to be, what the new protocol is going to be and set the tone. Folks, thanks for listening to the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast and Al. Thanks for being a guest. Inside Dot Lighting is where you get Al. Keystone Technologies. Go to K E Y S T O N E T E C H dot com, baby. That's practically innovative. Light made easy. There you go. Come on, man. So they have their retrofit uh, LED light engines, so field selectable. Now, you guys are seeing this on screen, and I'm not, so that's good because I didn't explain a lot of the things they have, but they have circular, they have rectangular, and they have these Illuma grooves. So basically any fixture out there, you can retrofit with these components with your Keystone driver. So you know you got a replaceable driver, you got an easy to find, and it's color selectable. So no more worrying about it. Sell the thing, then figure out the color, right? You don't want another step in the process. You want to sell it, move on. Oh, you want to change the color? Boom. 
sell my way out. Shoot first, ask questions last. Get after it, baby. Practically innovative Keystone Technologies. Man, they always coming out with hot, fun, cool stuff. The Get a Grip on Lighting guys to talk to you about out there. So go to K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, baby. That's KeystoneTech.com. Uh, I go there. Greg goes there. Hey, what about you? Don't feel guilty. Take action. And of course, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors, NAILD.org. That's the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. If you're a lighting distributor, time to join a trade association. It's only 650 bucks. Mm-hmm. That's right. NAILD.org. And thanks to Al Uzinski for, from Inside Lighting coming on the show. We're going to sell our way out of this thing, Greg. Let's do it. Written on the rectory wall, there's a sign there for all. You are lost, Lord is there to find you.